Tom Baldwin, what did you set out to do? Because this almost started life as helping with an autobiography. It's sort of an approved biography in the end, but what was the aim? It's not approved. It's, I, the phrase I've used, it's authoritative, but not authorised. Um, I haven't had him or a committee of Labour advisers passing every word. And I think it's quite important we didn't. Um, the idea was to tell his story, and it's a complicated story, and it's one which you don't get across in a soundbite or a speech or social media clip. And I think it's also important to recognise that he's got critics and talk to the critics, and sometimes even recognise the critics have a point. Could the tagline be more interesting than you think? Yes. Um, I'm quite, quite hard to fit it on a book, I think. But um, he... Look, people are complicated. Politics is complicated. And one of the reasons why I think people are asking questions about him is because he doesn't really fit the template of what a political leader is meant to be. You know, he has nuances, he has ambiguities. There are complexities about him, as there should be, because most people are complex. Politics is complex, solutions are complicated. And we've had too long of this is one big radical vision that's going to solve everything, and look where it's got us. I mean, and, and, and the sort of the lack of a big radical vision that you can sort of identify kind of runs through this, doesn't it? I mean, right to the end, um, where he admits he just wants to get things done. Yeah. Is that a good enough vision for well, the next it's, Prime it's, Minister? It's not done in a random fashion. You know, he set out these five missions, which I think are still probably the most underreported thing in politics. And it's fascinating watching the tape of the press conferences when he announced the mission of getting the highest growth in G7. Now, that's really difficult to do. In a rational world, people was asking, how will you do this? He didn't get a single question like that. He got questions about, can a woman have a penis, yes or no? One, you got a mission on stopping the boats like Rishi Sunak. So I think part of the problem is the way he's been reported because he doesn't fit that template. Part of the problem is the missions are broad, but they are meant to give the next Labour government a sense of direction. And if people want to know what he would do in government, that's the best place to start. Not quite sure. I did quite a long interview with him about how he'd do it. But, I, I, um, Channel 4 News <laughs> is always the exception to every rule. <laughs> but, but, I mean, I, I mean the, the, the thing about him that everyone talks about is the sort of, you know, is, is the slightly dour character, you know, char character of the man, the sort of the slightly reluctant politician, not charismatic in the traditional way. And the way you sort of explain that is his childhood and his parents in particular and his, his, his mother who was very ill and his dad who was pretty tough. Yeah, and I think that's... I mean, part of it's a generational thing. As a certain sort of Englishman growing up in the 1970s, you don't talk about yourself all the time. But I think there were particular circumstances in his childhood. You know, his mother was very ill. There wasn't room for someone else to have problems. If you're a teenage Keir Starmer, you can't talk about your feelings in that household because they were worried his mother was going to die any, any moment. So, you know, that, that creates a certain stiffness and buttoned-upness. But there's also, I think, something... You know, he, he's private. He's got this big network of friends, he's got these values, but he doesn't want to put them all out there. It's been quite hard drawing them out for the book because he's not like a politician. Most politicians are meant to have not only a vision but a tight little backstory which they wheel out. We've had to sort of chisel this out of him because it is a complicated story. It's one he's not always wanted to tell. Is it because he doesn't really want to be a politician? Or... Uh, no, he wants to be a politician, he wants to be prime minister. He hates being leader of the opposition. He really hates it. And, you know, it's the sort of thing that politicians might say, but he, he really hates it. He, you know, he describes it like being almost a like prison cell, marking off the days before you get general election. He went into politics, by his own account, to get things done, and he hasn't been able to get anything done, apart from the not inconsiderable achievement of changing the Labour Party. But he, but he had this very difficult entry into politics in that he was having to serve Jeremy Corbyn, who he disagreed with about various things. Um, and obviously that has now been a, a stick with which to beat him, because he said or apparently, you know, seemed to say and agree with things as the Shadow Cabinet uh, member that he has since ditched. So, I mean, who was the real Keir Starmer in those days? Well, the real Keir Starmer resigned from the front bench in 2016 and backed the opponent uh, to Jeremy Corbyn in 2016. Eventually. Yes, eventually. Uh, but, you know, he, he didn't want to create waves as a junior MP, elected only in 2015. He wanted to serve, he wanted a big job, and he was given a shadow Brexit secretary. Some of the people who didn't serve were telling him to stick in there because Brexit, if we remember those days, was quite an important issue. 
and they wanted a grown up doing it for Labour. Now, did he raise anti Semitism? Yes, both in public, and there's a record of that. Also in private, according to the members of the Shadow Cabinet. I mean, recollections differ, as the Queen might have said. Well, uh, Diane Abbott says he didn't. Everyone else says he did. So I'm not sure which one you choose to believe. I've got on the record quotes from Tom Watson. I've got quotes from one of Jeremy Corbyn's most senior aides who took a minute of every meeting saying Keir Starmer raised it several times in Shadow Cabinet. When you say he doesn't like being leader of the opposition, how hard did he try to become leader of the opposition? I think this is one of the interesting things in the book in that I've got an account of how he essentially had a, a leadership campaign up and running from the summer of 2019. They met in secret in a house in Arlington Road. They call themselves the Arlington Group. Uh, who were they? As, uh, his aides, uh, Jenny Chapman, who was one of his, uh, the members of his uh, shadow Brexit team at the time, one or two other MPs, including Steve Reid. Um, and their plans for a leadership election were quite well advanced. Morgan McSweeney was involved, who's now his campaign director. Um, so the plans for a leadership election were pretty uh, well established by the time of the 2019 general election. Um, and, and so, I mean, was he plotting, I mean, effectively? Or... I, I, he, I'm sure the left would say he was plotting. I'm sure he would say he was preparing for what he regarded as an inevitable defeat. Because he knew what was coming. Yeah. Um, what about the, the, you know, the, the move politically, then, that has come as a result of that? You know, again, he is, he is constantly criticised as a man who campaigned on a load of things to become leader of the Labour Party in order to please the then membership of the Labour Party that he has since ditched. Mm. I think this... I mean, he's moved around in a way he talks about this. Sometimes it's just like, that's over. You know, what he always said in the leadership campaign was you have to get Labour fit to fight an election, be a credible opposition again. That was the most important thing. He'll also sometimes say that quite a lot of his programme is actually radical and does reflect those ten pledges. It's not true that he's abandoned every single part of them, but it's also true that circumstances have changed. But did have. he have a moment? I mean, you know, you, you've identified this moment where he, he talked about resigning, which was the Harleypool by-election mm -hmm. loss. You know, is that a moment where he decided, right, OK, we've just got to move to the right, we've got to do what Tony Blair did, and we've got to get to the centre ground? I think there was a moment when he decided the change in the party had to be much bigger and go further and faster than he initially planned. One of the interesting things about Keir Starmer is he doesn't start with one big radical idea at the start and then compromise. He usually starts with a practical and fairly conventional plan and then become progressively more radical as time goes on. And so it's one of the reasons why it doesn't always make sense in politics, because people are expecting, so what's the big idea? So they turn their back on him, before they know it, he's, he's advanced quite far because he hasn't been doing it, trying to attract big headlines and attention. He just gets on and does it. He's the torsus. In as much as he's running against a hair. Um. So, so, I mean, in, in, terms, in terms of that journey politically, though, he's obviously got to have a very good relationship with Rachel Reeves. Um, now, you would not think that these were two people who were ideologically aligned. I mean, how close are they and how's, how's that relationship been formed? They come from quite similar backgrounds. Uh, you know, Keir Starmer's got, I think, working class background. Rachel comes from a, what you call a lower middle class background. Um, and both of them, have felt they've needed to sort of fight a bit harder, work a bit harder to be noticed in this rather sort of swaggery political world. He didn't know her until he appointed her to Shadow Cabinet. It's interesting, he doesn't hang out with MPs, he doesn't go to the terrace bar, he doesn't build these alliances. He'd hardly had a proper conversation with her until he put her in the Shadow Cabinet for the first time in, in 2020. The relationship has solidified and they've become quite bonded. I think, you know, if people want to know what happens in the next Labour government, I don't think you're going to see the sort of TBGB dramas between Blair and Brown that characterised last Labour government. It is quite a tight unit. Uh, when they're talking about how they're going to deliver these missions, people are talking about a quad of senior ministers, including Starmer and Reeves. They're talking about 
a delivery unit based somewhere between the Cabinet Office number 10 and number 11. A lot of thought is going now into the mechanism by which they will deliver these missions. Right, so, so when it came to, say, the £28 billion pledge on um, green investment that they've now, now ditched, now, this was something your old boss and, and friend Ed Miliband was absolutely knitted into. So how, 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 how did that happen? You know, I mean, because Ed Miliband's ended up getting the blame for that, effectively, hasn't he, politically? Well, it was announced by Rachel Reeves in 2021. And some people even then thought, what you're doing is announcing a number, not a policy. £28 billion isn't a policy, it's not a programme, it's not a mission. It just says you're going to spend a lot of money. To do that mid-Parliament, I think, was bad politics. And it was a mistake. But whose mistake was it? I think... It was a number of people's mistake. It, I mean, I don't, I, I don't think you can pin the blame on one person, to tell the truth. Uh, I think most people would recognise that the number had become a problem. It was getting in the way of making an argument about the green economy. If you come on Channel 4 News to talk about the mission to deliver clean energy by 2030, the only question you're getting is, are you sticking 28 billion? You're not able to make the argument about how you're going to leverage in lots of private sector investment, how you're going to, you know sort of change the way the electricity grid works, which are you know, what they're really quite into the, deep into the detail on now. So it's getting in the way of making an argument for the mission. But the way that's been portrayed by a lot of people is that that was Keir Starmer effectively kind of siding with Rachel Reeves, doing in Ed Miliband, he kind of carries the can for it. Is that the way he does business? Is he, is he ruthless? He's certainly ruthless. Um, I think the fact they stuck to 28 billion for as long as they did is actually an indication of how much he really, really does believe in this green agenda. He didn't want to dump it, but then recognised both the economic and political necessity of doing so. The economic circumstances have changed. The political circumstances have changed. 2021, no one thought Labour could win. This was a policy to get some attention. The sort of thing we did under Ed's leadership was announce big policies just to keep ahead above the water. They're now preparing for government. They're looking at how borrowing costs have gone up by, what, £70 billion on the government debt a year. You can't borrow that amount of money now. That's what they're saying. You're going to make yourself a huge target in the general election campaign. So there was a political imperative. There's also a imperative about not wanting to have a sort of run on the markets like we had with Liz Truss. I don't think they've resolved, though, from the mission of trying to get clean energy by 2030. I mean, you spent a lot of time in the book talking about his career. Um, and... Uh, and portraying him as a, you know, as a decent man. And that's very much his sell, isn't it? I'm a decent man, I was a lawyer, I was a DPP. Um, but it's also a, a way the Conservatives will attack him, which is looking at the people he defended. So how, how, how does he explain the unsavoury characters that he defended and how he felt about that? There's a sort of standard defence of lawyers turned politicians, the Cabrac principle. Yeah. I think he actually believed in something more, which is that... People deserve a free trial, no matter what they're supposed to have done, a fair trial. And he really does believe in, you know, if you're looking for a sort of ideological core of Keir Starmer, it's around these human rights, this, this belief in the dignity of people and respect for people. But that evolved in his legal career. In some areas, he changed his mind. In some areas, he just decided there's better ways of getting things done. So he moved from this outsider this human rights lawyer battering against the system and the establishment, to going inside the system as an advisor to the police in Northern Ireland and then chief prosecutor. It's an unusual transition. And then after a few years of chief prosecutor, he thought, actually, I can't really change things if I'm having to implement these cuts. I want to actually have my hands on the lever of power. He's had to wait nine years. I mean, he still don't know where Labour are going to win the next election. And he's frustrated. He wants to do stuff. That's the more than anything else. He's not interested in isms. He's not interested about whether there's a Starmerism. He's not interested in ideology. He's not interested in pinning labels on himself. He wants to show practical action in the pursuit of these missions, which will change people's lives. I mean, ha having been in a political insider yourself, working for Ed Miliband, having, having spent all this time thinking about um, Starmer, I mean, do, do you think he was, a, he was a better sell against Boris Johnson than he was against Rishi Sunak, who is another technocratic, less charismatic figure. It's interesting. I mean, he's faced three prime ministers now in the course of just four years as Labour leader. He's also trying to make a transition of the Labour Party 
which took Labour three leaders to do in the 80s and 90s. When Sunak became Prime Minister, it looked like he was contesting this territory of competence and centrism and integrity. The difference is that Sunak can't in the end. He's been pulled off into the sort of badlands of the wildest fringes of the Conservative Party by his party. He can't take rational decisions in this country's interest. Keir Starmer would say, and I think there's quite a lot of evidence suggesting he has done this, he's changed the Labour Party, he's in control of his party, he's turned it inside out so he can now face the electorate rather than as party members. And that's the difference you'll see. You're seeing a Labour Party talking to the country and a Conservative Party talking to itself. I mean, you know, the, the country might well be in the situation come the next election that it quite likes the idea of solid, stable, dependable integrity, uh, you know, as, a, as an option. But the question is sort of how sustainable that remains in politics, doesn't it? You know, do, does he remain popular as Prime Minister and is he re-electable? Or is it just a, a one-hit wonder? And that is the question. Um, we don't know. We don't know how Keir Starmer fought fair in government. We do know that he's got a record of running a government department effectively when he's head of the CPS and he brought in reforms and sometimes he stood up to the bureaucracy there to push things particularly on violence against women and girls. We do know that he's got a record of reform and change in the Labour Party, which has exceeded expectations. So I don't know, and there's all kinds of reasons why the next Labour government could run into difficulty. You know, the inheritance is rough, there's huge challenges. We're seeing, you know, Donald Trump may be elected president of America. We may end up with Europe fighting a war against Russia on its own. I don't know. What I do know is that the people who wrote Keir Starmer off in 2020 and said there is no way he could win a general election are exactly the same people now who are saying there's no way he can bring about meaningful change in government. And I kind of think, having been wrong once, they might need to be a little bit more humble than to underestimate him a second time. I, I mean, are you saying we need to, we need to think differently? We need, we need to stop looking for inspiration and vision and charisma and all of that, and, and, stop, and, and those are the wrong things to worry about? Uh, uh, yes. Because th 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 that all may be true, but the trouble is you then need a lot more to get hold of in terms of policy, and we don't have that either. Look, one of the problems he's got is, you know, he talks about this decade of national renewal in which he wants to bring the whole country with him. A lot of people, I think quite fairly, would say he doesn't have some of the political skills needed to do that. If you're going to bring the whole country with you, you need a bit of performative side of politics. You need some inspiration. He thinks he can do it by governing, by showing real change. But there's a... At the end of the book, I, I talk about how so much of politics in the last few years has been spectacle. Tony Blair sort of conjured up these castles in the sky, which didn't always become anything more than an artistic impression. Boris Johnson gathered his huge crowd around him as he set fire to what we've got. Keir Starmer, one of the, he always uses this phrase of building blocks, putting a building block there, another one there, moving it round. And it's not fun to watch. It's not going to be great to cover as a journalist. But at the end of it, he might have built a house. Tom Baldwin, thank you very much. Thank you.